will start shortly. Casting this live. So. Uh, Burradal, good morning. Welcome to this session of the Welsh Affairs Committee where we're continuing our inquiry looking at prisons in Wales and the, the theme of this morning's uh, evidence session is housing and uh, housing support for prisoners and we've got two panels. The first panel we are joined by Chloe Marshall who's the Wales Operations Manager for NACRO and we're joined by Katie Dalton who's the Director of Comorth Cymru. And perhaps we can start the discussion by just asking you both just to outline very briefly how your agencies support prisoners in Wales. Um, Chloe Marshall, perhaps you could go first, please. Of course. Um, <clears throat> um, so we deliver a number of contracts in Wales for the MOJ. We've got the CAS2 contract, that's accommodation for individuals um, who might be on home t- t- um, curfew detention curfew and we also um, who or who might be on bail and and at risk of recall. We also have um, the dynamic framework contract which supports individuals both in the community and in custody um, who have accommodation needs so that might be to find accommodation or it might be to help them um, maintain and sustain their accommodation and then in the sort of wider landscape through other funding mostly housing support grants we have some accommodation for people um, leaving prison um, supported accommodation. We deliver some floating support in B&Bs to try and help people maintain that. Um, and we, ha- we also deliver um, some accommodation, some support in temporary accommodation, which is like 24-7 support, again, just to try and help people maintain it and thrive for the next steps into more sustained accommodation. OK, thank you very much. Can I ask how many prisoners in Wales, roughly, would, would, would your agency support? In this area, um, through the dynamic framework, we're only working in Berwyn because we've only got the North Wales contract. Um, the CAS2 operates um, mostly in South Wales. Um, I must say, I don't manage it. I've got some information about it. I'll do my best to respond as best as I can, and I can get anything back to you that I'm not sure about. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Katie Dobson, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, So, uh, Camorth Cymru is the representative body for providers of homelessness and housing support services in Wales, so we're not a direct service provider. Uh, We have over 80 members um, across the length and breadth of Wales, varying sizes and specialisms, many of whom will support people with a history of offending uh, through more generic services, um, but also some of our members will provide specific services to people who've experienced the criminal justice system. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. But not all of your members would necessarily be in the space of supporting prisoners. Is that- um, most would not be specialists, but okay. it would surprise me if not all of them had experience supporting people who'd had contact with the criminal justice system. Okay. And in terms of what's been going on in the kind of residential housing sector across Wales generally in recent years, w- would you say that the job of you and your members in terms of supporting prisoners with housing needs is becoming harder? Absolutely. Um, you know, in a, in a recent survey of our members um, last year, uh, I, I think over 80% said that uh, demand for housing support and homelessness services had increased, and over 90% had said the complexity of support needs. So that's talking about the general homelessness population, but I think um, what people are seeing is people with lots of co-occurring complex needs, so that might be offending, coupled with mental health um, challenges, substance use issues, um, often trauma from childhood, um, and I think the complex of that is growing. Certainly we've seen um, a huge demand for homelessness and housing support services in Wales. Um, We have record numbers in in temporary accommodation, over 11,000 people um, currently in temporary accommodation based on the latest Welsh Government statistics. Um, And I think the last published one showed that I think um, around 1,500 were being moved into temporary accommodation in January um, and only about 700 were being moved on to settled accommodation. So you can quite quickly do the maths and you're seeing huge numbers going into temporary accommodation, presenting as homeless, um, and not enough settled accommodation being available for people to move on. So in pe- seeing people stuck in temporary accommodation for uh, potentially up to two years or even more for some people, um, often in temporary accommodation that isn't suitable for their needs, without access to cooking facilities, laundry facilities. Um, for single people, that's challenging enough. For people with families, even more difficult to cope with that. Um, and local authorities are, are, are on their knees. There's 
there's just not enough accommodation out there. Um, I'd say temporary accommodation is, is maxed out in mo most areas. So, you know, in terms of choice, there isn't any. Local authorities will do their best to find somewhere for someone. Um, and that often means that, I think, for people coming out of, of prison who have maybe um, sought help for their mental health and substance use inside prison and managed to make progress in their recovery, um, sometimes the options that are available to them when they come out in terms of temporary accommodation um, will not support that recovery. And I've certainly spoken to um, people uh, on the streets who've said that they've deliberately not gone into temporary accommodation because they're, they've worked really hard um, to recover from their addiction and they don't want to put that at risk and they know other people within those settings will be struggling with addiction and be active users as well. And I should mention that one of the things that my organisation has done over the last nine months is spoken to over 300 people with lived experience of homelessness mm. as part of the Welsh Government's um, legislative reform agenda um, and that included two visits to prison, two visits to probation services as well. That's really helpful, thank you very much. And Chloe Marshall, would you broadly concur with what um, Katie's just shared? Absolutely, <clears throat> and I think for people leaving prison, um, whilst there is a commitment, a real strong commitment from the local authority to make sure that there is some a pro something available, temporary accommodation. They don't know where they're going to be. So for an area that is very dispersed, their support network could be two hours away from where they're placed, but they can't kind of make arrangements to get any script or anything like that sorted prior to release. So there's this kind of window on release that creates huge challenges for people. In terms of what perhaps you see with um, the work done by colleagues in England, would you say there's any significant differences in the experience at the moment uh, when it comes to housing of prisoners in Wales compared to prisoners in England? I think that in, we, we are very fortunate in Wales that there is a real push to make sure that people aren't leaving prison and having nowhere to go. So whilst temporary accommodation isn't ideal, at least th th there is an option of not being on the streets. I think, I think we're very, very fortunate in that respect. Yeah, I think you know my colleagues operating in England would say that they're facing very, very similar challenges. Um, and I think that um, the commitment from the Welsh government in terms of keeping everyone in and, and providing accommodation for as many people as possible is certainly, I think, different in tone um, and commitment to in England. Um, I think that the development of the, um, the pa national pathway um, for homelessness for people leaving prison that was developed about nine years ago um, certainly hasn't solved all of the problems, but I think it is an example of devolved and non-devolved organisations trying to work together to find solutions that match up both the, at the time, the Transforming Rehabilitation Agenda and the Housing Wales Act of 2014 to try and understand, you know, how can we better coordinate all of those different responsibilities from devolved and non-devolved to try and make it work. Um, I think the reality of um, implementation of that has not been as successful as people would have liked um, for obvious reasons, um, but, I, but I think that the intent was there to work together and I think I think that the Women's Justice Blueprint is another example of where Welsh Government officials have worked together with um, UK Government officials on the justice side to try and work together on a shared aim to um, you know, reduce the offending and reduce the harm affecting women um, in Wales who have interacted or been at risk of the criminal justice system. But I think the broader housing environment is, is really similar in challenges to England, yeah. but I think there are some differences in Wales, certainly in intent, even if that doesn't necessarily follow through to um, you know, perfect outcomes for people. Really helpful, great way to start the discussion. Um, Tonya, please. Thanks, Chair. Just a general question, really, but where do most prison leavers in Wales spend their first night once they're released from custody? I would say generally in temporary accommodation, maybe in B&B &B accommodation, mm. but they, as I was saying, they don't necessarily know where that temporary accommodation is going to be, because the local authority aren't that, you know they they're so stretched they've got you know they they don't have an awful lot of stock so they're kind of working on a day to day void basis so whilst there's a commitment from everybody to support people on release to have somewhere to go whilst the um, application for assistance is being done 
um, in custody and people are working in custody together with the local authority, it's still what is available on the day. Um, so I think that, that's a, that as, a, as I mentioned, that's a huge challenge um, for individuals who are being, being released. Um, and also, I think that it's at that point, once they're released, is when a lot of the community organisations are really able to um, start looking at what solutions there are available. Some of the examples I've been given, um, and, and you, we talk about you know release state, is that some of the communications between the people that they're being released to, the temporary accommodation, is that they're actually releasing them, the prisons, they're releasing them early. And, and, and is that somewhere that you is that something you see happening in Berwyn? Yeah, the early release, particularly now with the early release scheme, I think the the, the challenges there are. are have definitely compounded. I mean, what we've seen on a couple of occasions where people have been released early is that we've not been able to necessarily work together as organisations to come up with a co cohesive plan to support that individual to thrive because there are lots and lots of challenges, potentially physical challenges, you know, so it'd be nice to have occupational health to really understand what would be the best placement for that individual and to plan for it, but we, we don't necessarily always get that that um, time. Yeah, and I think the um, certainly my recollection during COVID was that some of the early release um, happening at a time when such um, demand was on homelessness services anyway, because um, you know we went for a, from a situation where. Um, certain groups of people were not entitled to temporary accommodation pre-pandemic to that everyone in approach in order to, to kind of deal with the infection control issues and then some of the early releases happening put additional pressure onto local authorities and the difficulty was um, the lack of appropriate information and time to deal with this. Now you know I, I would agree um, many many coming out into temporary accommodation some people I spoke to within prison and probation weren't even given accommodation were given a tent and a sleeping bag um, and you know the, the desperation that they have to make a fresh start you know many of them that I spoke to within the prison I visited um, recognised that they'd done wrong had done their time felt that they'd kind of got to the point where you know they'd done their time and they wanted a fresh start and they were desperate to have a home because the home is the foundation of everything else if you don't have a home mm. then it's really difficult to do all sorts of things in life including get employment um, manage to uh, turn up to appointments whether that's health your script um, some people that I spoke to told um, they were placed in a B&B &B and they had to walk uh, 90 minutes every day to get their methadone script. 90 minute walk every single day. How we expect people to stay on recovery and to be able to do that. And I would suggest that that, that isn't necessarily about the local authority choosing to place someone 90 minutes walk away. It's about the lack of accommodation and probably the lack of information and planning that was given there. Um, another person said they were placed out of county and they had to get taken two buses just to get to their probation appointments we hear from other people you miss three probation appointments and you get recalled so you know the, the phrase I heard most often in the prison was we are being set up to fail um, you know we've done our time we want a fresh start a home is absolutely essential and lots of people having absolutely no confidence that they would have one um, when they were leaving prison so, and, and that's really key isn't it Katie because uh, because also your organisation represents over 80 homelessness, housing and support service providers in Wales. You know, how do they work well together? And, and really, such a huge number of organisations, and we see it as well with our, some of our constituents. How, you know, is this, is this not hindering the journey of the person that's being released from prison? Uh, or or is, is it a good thing? How, I mean, I think it's probably important to distinguish between the numbers of charities operating out in the community who mm. are really varied. So I think it's really important to have a diversity of support providers. You'll know that some are specialists in, in, in Valder SV, some are specialists in young people, um, as well as some of the more generic providers. In terms of the prison setting, I think something that I have heard is that there are lots of different organisations operating in the space, um, but not enough clarity um, and coordination. So um, if organisations are saying they're unsure who is responsible for what or who might be the, the, the single point of contact, what must it feel like for a prisoner in there? Um, so, so I would suggest that, you know, there are lots of organisations that bring excellent skills and expertise to the table, um, so it doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of them, but it's about better coordination and clarity. 
Yeah, I mean, high-risk sex offenders, for example, you know, single men going out in, in, into in, into the community, into specialist housing, you know, they're usually stuck in specialist housing and can't be moved on and therefore create a blockage in a system because no private, you know, tenant, you know, they're not going to want them going into this accommodation. Now, so they end up bed blocking and then they can't move on from their situation because the other thing that I was told was that the new, and that's the other thing I wanted to ask, they, they can't evict them either due to the, the new Renting Homes Act. So, so there's a blockage in a system here. How does that get unblocked and how do these people get the support services that they need? Because what they're doing is, they, and you've spoken about this, they're getting stuck in a system where, sorry Chair, right. <laughs> but they're getting stuck in a system that's not helping them and they've come from a structured environment in the prison to being stuck in a system, bored, getting back into their old routine again and, and, and having those, you know, what's got to change basically, what have we got to do? housing supply and that's not unique to prisoners but I think when you think about um, the stigma that people um, in, in prison face and the judgments that are placed and the, how that feeds into things like allocations of housing and whether people are prepared to take them on if you've not got enough housing for the general population then you know I would say that prisoners are probably bottom of the list for many landlords and I think that goes to social housing we have not built enough social housing for the last 40 years the Welsh government's got its 20,000 um, social housing commitment for this Senate term which is a really great start but we're playing catch up mm -hmm. and then in terms of the private rented sector the major issue has been local housing allowance rates um, so I think research done by uh, the Bevan Foundation showed that about 2% of properties in Wales were available at local housing allowance rates mm -hmm. so again you know that's a challenge to the, to the whole population and certainly people experiencing homelessness that my members support and then if you look at the kind of specific group of people living in prison who are probably going to be much more disadvantaged when it comes to allocating that so so building more social housing addressing you know the issues with the welfare system so we're pleased that local housing allowance rates are going to be increased as of this month um, we hope we see a shift in in the amount of um, properties that are available to people who are limited by local housing allowance rates um, but I'd also say that the shared accommodation rate which is the rate um, awarded to people under 35 means that they're priced out of, of much of the private rent sector so I think it's a bigger housing supply issue but of course a multi-agency support that goes in to help people make those steps is absolutely critical as well because it's 70 pounds a week isn't it moment what's it going to so it, it's it's different in different local authority areas um but yeah it's supposed to represent 30 percent of the available private rented properties there's the lower 30th um, percentile um, and it hasn't it's represented in recent times one percent um which you know you can imagine the impossibility and and that's part of the reason why we've still got eleven thousand people in temporary accommodation is because people physically have not been able to afford private rented because of the housing benefit limits yeah, okay. Um, so, talking about all the, all the different different stakeholders as well, um, on HMPPS's side alone, you've got an accommodation pathway coordinator, strategic housing advisor, specialist housing advisor, and a prison resettlement team who are going to be involved in varying degrees with the process. Are there too many actors, Chloe? I think it shows a real commitment, doesn't it, to really supporting people leaving prison and, and you know we've got to welcome that. And I also think there's a real, real commitment to coordinating that approach. There's a lot that happens. You know, the governor of the prison really works hard to bring us all together. Um, you know, there's working group round tables that are going on that are working hard to try and bring people together. And I think that the, there is a commitment because like Katie mentioned, um, it, it, the, there's a wide net with lots and lots of people in it and hopefully that means that there are fewer well, places to slip through it, right? Um, I think the staff turnover challenge is something that you know we've been thinking a little bit about in terms of this question because whilst there's lots of processes that bring these everybody together, every time you have somebody a staff turnover, then you're having to kind of retrain and you know get that person back into that process and understanding all of the different people. So I think that's created some challenges is it, for in us. Is there a high staff turnover? Um, we have certainly seen a high staff turnover in our in in NACRO in Wales mm -hmm. over the last couple of years and I think that's you know 
I think it's very, very challenging in terms of the work that we're doing. It, it has a huge um, strain on, on staff in terms of kind of emotional well-being and we're not necessarily... Um, uh, you know, the, the salaries aren't, aren't there because there isn't a lot of money for us to pay people, I guess, you know. And um, so, yeah, we have seen a higher staff turnover than what we have been used to in, in previous years, for sure. Thank you. Anything to add, Katie? Um, I, I think just what I said before about um, cl clarity and coordination. Um, you know, I think many people have commented that there's many players in this in this field, um, and that there is a lack of clarity and coordination and communication. I think for me, it's about the quality of information and the timeliness of information. So the prisoner pathway um, accommodation pathway sets out at certain times that have been agreed both with devolved and non-devolved agencies um, around doing assessment of housing need, of um, creating resettlement plans, um, of then communicating with the local authority where that prisoner has a local connection so that the local authority can then act on trying to prevent or secure accommodation. I think that if we were able to get the quality of information and the timeliness of information sorted, then local authorities would, would be able to act on that much more quickly. <coughs> it's, I think, incomplete information. I think it often comes too late. Um, and, and, you know, prisoners have, have said to me, you know, we've, we've done this assessment, I've, I've told them what my situation is, it's been sent off, and then I get to the week of release and nothing's happened and I don't have anything so where is it going wrong in that system? Strategic housing advisors then that were put in place effective or not? Can't comment on specific roles I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you Chair. Just conscious of time so we're probably going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, so Ben Lake show us how it's yeah, going. Do so. Chair, uh, thank you very much to you both for, for attending this morning. Um, Recent inspections sort of suggest that different prisons are doing, are faring better than others uh, in terms of ensuring that um, suitable post-release accommodation um, for prison leavers. Why do you think some prisons do better than others? If I can start with Katie. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, coming here today is with the caveat that I work in the homelessness sector and I'm not an expert in all things criminal justice, but I think there's a number of factors that probably contribute to this. I think um, the length of sentences and the turnover within prisons, so we know that in some prisons there is greater turnover, greater inflow and outflow, um, and I think that what I understand is that's very difficult to manage. So if you look at the prisoner accommodation pathway, there are certain time lengths in there, and for some of the people on, on shorter term sentences or on remand actually they will be in there such a short period of time that it kind of won't fit into that prisoner pathway um, so I think that that comes into it and I think that where people are on longer sentences there is obviously an ability to be able to to kind of plan and manage that more effectively um, I also think that whether people are local um, to the area in which they're placed is, is really important so it might be that a local authority that is wh where a prison is based has much better relationships and communication potentially opportunities to go into the estate build those relationships with staff and um, people within the prison estate but the those who, you know, if someone is placed in um, Bridge End but is in a different part of Wales, then that, that can be really challenging for obvious reasons. So I think that plays into it. And then I also think, you know, um, the complexity of support needs. You know, I mentioned earlier the, the co-occurring needs of people. And um, for some people, there are decades worth of trauma um, that have led them to be where they are. Um, and a lot of that is is not been unpicked. A lot of that people have self-medicated and become addicted to substances. So I think the ability to kind of um, support people and work through that. Um, and then I think, you know, the services and the join up that's available on the other side when people go out of prison and into the community and how joined up that is. Um, I can't speak specifically to the, the different prisons, but I think those are some of the issues which for me play a part in the in the kind of differences in consistency. Thank you, Katie. Uh, um, Chloe, do you have anything to add? Um, specifically, do you, do you find that uh, local authorities in which you do have prisons, are they... Um, better uh, when it comes to ensuring that any leavers who have a fixed address in their patch secure um, proper and appropriate accommodation portions. Yeah. So we, own, uh, we only operate across North Wales so I really right. can't speak to the South Wales and so it's not I think a very good sort of example size for me to provide but um, I, I think really the only point I would come back to is what Katie's mentioned is that 
Where we've got services, like housing services, in, in Wrexham, it's much easier for our staff to go in and have a chat and meet with people and maybe do interviews prior to release for people to access accommodation. Where they're a long, long way away, you know, South Gwynedd, you know, two hour, three hour drive, yeah. then it's, it's much more challenging. So there will be that natural join up. Um, but that I, I, broader than that, I really couldn't. Oh no, no, that, that's very useful. Well, thank you. And I just was, um, Katie, if I could just tell you very briefly that that point, you know, that Chloe makes about, um, and also you made it as well in your answer about those local authorities that are further away from prisons. Do you think there is a need to look again at the way in which support services based in those home areas, for want of a better way of putting it, engage with prisoners um, yeah. before they are released? Yeah, and, and interestingly enough, there's um, been a recently established Welsh Government group looking at this in particular. Um, so the um, committee might be aware that there is a programme of legislative reform happening in Wales. Um, a white paper was published before Christmas on ending homelessness, which we're very, very supportive of. Um, and I think, you know, all stakeholders are really supportive of doing something to um, ensure that fewer prisoners um, are homeless when they come out of prison. But I think everyone recognises it's a really challenging area. So um, a group has been set up by the Welsh Government to explore this so um, they're looking at reciprocal arrangements they're looking at how you know how do we ensure um, that if you're in a local authority that isn't where a prison is based how do you ensure that you get the right quality of information um, you know is you know does the local authority where the prison is based take on more of that you know and then there'll be questions about capacity and funding and, and all the rest of it so yeah it's a very live discussion that's happening at the moment thank you that's very interesting okay thank you very much Beth Winter please Good morning. Um, just picking up on your point, Katie, earlier about people having a home, because it's not about having a house, it's much, much more. So as well as the issues around supply of housing, we've also had evidence about the quality of the accommodation in terms of it being squalid or um, not just about the location, but the actual quality in, in, internally. Um, so why you know what was your experience in in Camorth regarding quality of accommodation and who has the authority or duty to monitor that that quality of housing before um ex offenders access it so um i believe that there is welsh government um regulations and standards around the quality of, of temporary accommodation um, and local authorities should be ensuring that any temporary accommodation they provide in line with their legal duties um, is, reaches that standard. Um, I think probably the challenges that we've experienced since the pandemic is that the, the numbers that we're talking about, I mentioned earlier, over 11,000 people in temporary accommodation Wales far exceed the provision that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's been really challenging for local authorities to A, provide temporary accommodation full stop and B to ensure that standards are being met um, and I think that um, there are you know some providers of, of accommodation who will not take people um, who are known to them who maybe have a reputation um, and offending history um, and therefore the options that are available to that person become less and less but you know I'm very clear that people um, should be afforded dignity they should be afforded standards regardless of what their background is um, and that it's important that, that that is delivered and it's unacceptable where that that accommodation doesn't doesn't meet those standards but is is, is, is your experience or the providers that you, you, you um, support, that the accommodation is generally unsuitable, not just temporary accommodation, there are some who are unfurnished, because I can remember, because I was, I was working in housing, lots of people would come out of prison and they'd, they'd be in a, in a flat with absolutely nothing in there, you can't expect somebody to retain a tenancy where they haven't even got a sofa to sit on so yeah so I think generally where our members are involved um, they are really strong advocates on behalf of the people that they support so I think that they will play a role in, in sort of saying this isn't an ac acceptable and then advocate into the local authority to provide alternative I think where people don't have that that support worker that independent third sector maybe support worker to advocate on their behalf and um, then they often feel at a loss um, and I think people feel that you know that 
this is all I'm, I'm entitled to for some people. They, they kind of have got to a point where they accept that they don't deserve anything. Um, you know, I, I spoke to, to one guy on probation who um, his universal credit had been uh, messed up and for three weeks he didn't get his universal credit and had to walk around in his prison tracksuit and he said, oh, I thought this was just part of the punishment. Mm. So I think there's something about um, the level of, of confidence and ability to advocate on behalf of yourself when you've been through an institution um, and the importance of advocates in the third sector to advocate for you. Um, I'd, I'd say that the majority of accommodation that, that my members work with people in is of a, you know, a decent standard, but I think that would that would vary considerably. Um, and I agree, real issues in terms of having furniture, being able to access funds to be able to have some of those. And as you said, a, a home is not just a roof over your head, it's all of those things. And one issue actually that came up when um, I was speaking to both men in the prison and um, people in probation is the loss of belongings um, when they're taken into prison. So not only were people losing their homes, um, sometimes that was because it was a long-term sentence and they couldn't hold on, Sometimes it was short sentences, but they were being um, politely encouraged uh, by their landlord to give up their property, and in, in some uh, you know times being quite forceful in that. But also, were losing belongings, and you know, one guy said, "I lost all of my belongings, and that included the only photo I had of my dead child, um, and I now have nothing, and I don't know how." I'm supposed to exit prison and start afresh when I've lost one of the things that is most dear to me. Another man I spoke to said I grabbed my mum's ashes and a suitcase and that's all I could carry with me and nothing else. So, um, you know, this is one of the things that the Welsh Government's looking at in the white paper is not only about retention of accommodation where possible, but also retention of belongings because people are human beings um, and all of those things are really important to all of us um, when we think about if we had to move house or we had a change in circumstances and it's, it's to the, the person and the dignity that we afford them. So I think those things are also important. Thank you. I and Chloe, quickly, in terms of the Ministry of Justice ensuring that the CAS two accommodation is suitable, how does that work? They're, they're very on it. So right. we have our own sort of, you know, um, structure where we have checks and balances and a whole team that supports that and manages. But they come out once a month and check quite and a high number. suitable you, as, in terms of... Like, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they do quite a lot. But can I just speak to your point about um, the home? Yeah. Because I think that's really interesting when we talk about the temporary accommodation bit because I think that it's um, a lot of the individuals that we're supporting um, are... Um, you know they're, they're going through an awful lot at that moment and um, sometimes it, it's easy for them to not necessarily comply with the conditions that are part of their B&B you know so if they stay away they go and see somebody because it's a long way away um, then it, it, it's, it's incredibly temporary and they can lose that accommodation so easily so you know, we talked before about um, the, the Renting Homes Act and how difficult that is at least that gave people a level of security this the temporary accommodation is is it's not just temporary because you know if this it, it's a room with very little else mm. it is very temporary because they don't have any real rights to stay there if you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you and, and chloe um, can i also just ask in terms of the evidence we've had there seems to be more people <laughs> leaving prison in wales um becoming homeless and in England is that's the, that's the data that we've been shown so far is that is that your experience that is that it that no no that's not no no when I speak okay. to my colleagues across the border it seems to be a more common issue for prison leavers sorry to be specific no, no okay no that that is not not my not my experience but I'm not sure if some of that information wasn't from before the legislation changed, was well, it? Information you could send us, maybe some data. I, I can have a look. In that, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. And, and Katie, finally, sorry. Um, you, you, obviously, supply of housing and quality are issues. But what what else can be done to reduce the numbers of ex-offenders um, leaving prison and becoming homeless? And it was a huge question. Um, because there's, there's, there's a lack of transition, isn't there? So in terms of support people get in prison and then they, they, they just sort of left to go out. So, so that's definitely um, an issue. Should people go in prison in the first place? I mean, there's a whole... <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, 
I think where possible we should avoid short sentences because I think the disruption that that causes to people in terms of losing home, losing jobs, um, disruption to children, mm. particular uh, concern for women, um, for me that would be uh, one of the key things that we can do, have more community based uh, kind of provision where people are able to retain their home and, and obviously co you know carry out uh, community orders that sort of thing I think would be uh, my preference in terms of short sentences I think that early identification um, on uh, reception as to people's housing status wherever possible being able to retain that housing um, and that might mean accessing um, housing benefit where it's not been claimed before it might be about having someone that liaises with landlords to try and convince them to hold on to that um, it might be about accessing discretionary housing payments to top up rent um, if, if the, the sentence goes slightly beyond the housing benefit time that people are allowed to have that. I think quality of information um, that goes to local authorities and timeliness of information. Um, I think that... Um, the, the coordination and the capacity is really, really important. And I think at the moment, local authorities are so overwhelmed by the scale of homelessness in Wales that um, it's just really, really difficult to cope with. I've mentioned welfare. Um, let's keep an eye on local housing allowance rates and see whether that makes a difference. But also the under 35 rate is just um, unacceptable. Um, I think the multi-agency point, so I think that, um, you know, people who have uh, mental health support and substance use uh, support in prison, having been able to access that immediately on release, so getting rid of Friday releases because that is a nightmare for people, being able to um, help people connect with those services. I heard some really nice examples, actually, from speaking um, to, to some people is that uh, the Voddle um, in South Wales um, are able to go into prison and sort out the meds for people um, so that they've got their medication for 10 days post-release and um, that's something that I spoke to someone about so an example of really good practice multi-agency working and um, that has meant that that person gets that that support that medication they need for, for 10 days um, I heard another story um, from speaking to uh, men in prison on probation about peers meeting them on, on exit and helping to take them um, to the local council, people who've been through that themselves and understood how challenging it was, who could empathise with the men and, and taking them to the places they needed to be. Um, because I, you know, I think that connection is really important. Sorry, I'm just conscious of time, but other people are having questions. Sorry, Th thank you. Very interesting. Thanks, Thanks Beth. T Tonya, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you said there, Katie, about the short sentences. So, they've basically, if, if you've re-offended again, then you'll have to go back in, you're out of the accommodation system, and that all starts again. Do you have data around that? I don't have data, I'm afraid, but it's Would certainly... Would it exist? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, the Ministry of Justice must have data on that but it's certainly something that I hear about that kind of cycle of recall and and often recall um, because people don't have accommodation examples of people who have um, refused temporary accommodation because they don't think it's going to help with their recovery and then being recalled because they don't have accommodation and that's a condition of their license um, people missing appointments because they don't have a home mm -hmm. um, it, you know and that ending up in recall and then people um, not being able to get released because they don't have accommodation so it's a vicious cycle that people get into. Yeah. And one of the other questions that I've got is, is, you know, the committee has raised its concerns about the level of support available for prison leavers once they conclude their time in CAS 3 accommodation. Um, why do some local authorities have the CAS 3 funding and some don't? Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just couldn't I speak to that. Answer, sorry. Yeah. And, and, and when... And, and the other thing I wanted to know was... was um, when does the housing and homeless support for prison leavers in Wales currently end? You know, do we know when that kind of ends and are there any gaps that we need to be looking at? So the CAS 2 um, accommodation can last for up to six months, but I think it's about the joined upness thereafter. Yeah. There are other services out there, there are lots of other services around, and it's how people work together. Um, for some people, they might not need support thereafter. You know, it might have been more focused around the accommodation. But for other people who do need support, it's about how they link into the, the support providers that are available, maybe schemes funded through HSG and other things. We have gateways, a lot of the local authorities, that, so people could be referred into a gateway to find the most appropriate provider. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that makes sure that um, 
people aren't falling through the gaps because they're referred to somewhere who doesn't have capacity, so then they get put on a waiting list and it doesn't happen. If they haven't got capacity, you know, the gateways know where the capacity lies and can make sure that the right support. So it's about how we all work together, I think, on that one. I would say, yeah, that there may well be limits to when the kind of um, criminal justice support ends, but actually in Wales what we have is the Housing Support Grant, which is a successor to the Supporting People programme. Um, that The ring fence around supporting people in England was was um, was got rid of a, a number of years ago and services have been decimated in England because we've maintained the ring fence uh, in Wales. It's now called the Housing Support Grant. There are housing-related support services that can support people after they've um, <coughs> stopped receiving support specifically within in the criminal justice system um, and those are, are not time limited if people need support to maintain their tenancy to avoid that risk of homelessness then uh, people should be able to get that th support through the local authority and that's what the majority of my members deliver through yeah and I'm, I'm just following on from there then you know come off Cymru is representing both Pobol and Shelter Cymru um, who deliver the prison link service how effective is their engagement with key partners such as local authority housing teams and the Department for Work and Pensions? So I, I think Chloe can speak to you. You had a conversation with um, Shelter Cymru. Um, I spoke to Pob all the other day and they've actually handed back the contract um, for Prison Link Cymru. Um, I think from their perspective, it didn't align with their kind of um, core business plan and, and strategy. Um, I think they recognised that they're, you know, not specialists at working in prisons and didn't think that they, um, you know, wanted to continue to operate in, in, in that space. Um, but I think, again, feedback from speaking to Pobble and others is that um, lots of people working in that space and not a clear sense of um, who is coordinating, if anyone at all. Um, difficult to get people into the estate if you're not part of the criminal justice system so if you're third sector like like Pobble or others really difficult to get people in when you have turnover of staff again really difficult to get the new staff in and then to kind of get high quality information from the various people is quite challenging as well so you know I think their their main reason for handing back that contract is that it's it's not really fitting in with the, their kind of broad provision um, but I think there are challenges that, that are experienced when working in the secure estate as a third sector organisation that are difficult to... When you're committed to delivering the best possible outcomes for people you support, um, it's frustrating when you come up with challenges, I think. One of the, things, to do. Oh, sorry, sorry, one of the things that Shelter highlighted with the big challenge was where people are... Um, um, in custody over the border, yeah, you know. So if if somebody's in Berwyn and they're having to try and accom find accommodation that will support people who live in England, the, the whole sort of devolved housing aspect it, it, it creates challenges for them in terms of the work that they're doing because it's two very different processes that they have to understand and learn and be aware of. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much, Ruth Jones. Please. Um, and following on, and you you both painted a very realistic. Um, accurate picture which chimes with what we've we've heard you know when we went to Cardiff prison for instance but in terms it's a very bleak picture and that's just for prisoners in Wales I'm interested in women obviously our um, offenders are housed in English prisons how does that chime uh, how does that fit in with the situation because obviously you're dealing with say Chloe with Berwyn but what happens about the women coming back yeah so um, when I was speaking to colleagues in CAS 2, they were telling me that they're actually housing... 17% of their housing is used for women coming back into Wales, um, which is higher than anywhere that they, any other place that they deliver in England. Um, and they were also telling me that they have an, um, a unit where um, the, the, late, the woman has got her children staying with her as well, which I think is really lovely because I think that's one of the big things that we tend to see for whatever reason, more with women, is that there's a real desire to get a safe place for them and their children, and a lot of temporary accommodation isn't always, you know, in bed and breakfast where there's lots of other people. Um, we, we, we have, on a couple of occasions, found that it's, people have decided to kind of give custody of their children to maybe um, their partner or parents because they don't feel like it's a very safe space for their children to be. Um, so I can't really speak much, to, uh, you know, we have some support services where we're supporting women who um, 
who are coming out of custody and we're, we're sort of supporting them in their temporary accommodation through our flowing support through the HSG grant that Katie mentioned um, and we have seen instances where they've been placed in um, temporary accommodation um, and then been recalled on four attempts four, four times um, because they're just not they're not feeling very safe in the temporary accommodation um, is what they're telling us um, so it's really, really challenging, I think, and really, really challenging for, for a lot of people, yeah. for a lot of women coming out. Absolutely, Katie, did you? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, my point about um, short sentences is, you know, um, even more important, I think, when it comes to women and the impact on children caring responsibilities as well. And I think certainly, you know, because we don't have a women's prison in Wales, and I'm certainly not advocating for a women's prison in Wales, um, it is so much more challenging for women. I think there are some really committed organisations working in that space who, who care deeply about the work that they do, supporting women, who understand, um, I think, the, the, you know, the high, high levels of trauma, abuse, um, that, that often women in the criminal justice system have experienced and um, the need to be trauma informed is something that I would say across all services but particularly for women um, in the criminal justice system making sure that that trauma informed support is there for them um, when they are released from prison that they feel safe so coming back to home and some of the comments Chloe made about the types of accommodation that women are placed in safety is um, often not been there for many of those women throughout their lives um, and so uh, being released from prison into something where that feels really really unsafe is, is really really problematic um, and can lead to them falling into addiction and, and, and more engagement with the criminal justice system so you know I would like to see fewer women going into prison um, and, and staying closer to home and more community solutions being um, developed with, with women's centres with those specialist uh, women's organisations operating in that field because the histories are so complex behind many of those women. Thank you very much both. I'll hand you back to the chair now. Thank you Ruth. And that brings us to the end of this first part of today's session. So Chloe Marshall uh, from NACRA, thank you very much. Katie Dalton from Comorth Cymru, thank you both for your really frank, uh, insightful, very helpful uh, information that you've shared with us. We're going to suspend the sitting now for one minute while we transition over to our second panel. Thank you. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 OK, good morning and, and welcome back to uh, the, this session of the Welsh Affairs Committee where we're looking at uh, prisons in Wales and specifically the challenge of housing prisoners. For this second panel, we are joined in the committee room by Stephanie Rogers-Lewis, who is Housing Need Manager at Cardiff City Council, welcome. And we're joined virtually from Wrexham County Borough Council 
by Tracy Haig, who's Head of Service for Housing, and Lisa Ridge, who's Housing Options and Allocations Lead. So thank you to all three of you for making time for the committee this morning. Perhaps I can start this part of the discussion just by asking uh, from both local authority perspectives, if you could just help us understand how you see the challenges for prison leavers in your local authority areas. And perhaps Stephanie from Card, if you could go first, please. Yeah, of course. Oh, gosh, I suppose it's quite vast, isn't it? I mean, within Cardiff ourselves, we employ a prison link officer whose role is kind of vital, really, for us to understand the needs of those prisoners. I suppose what we're seeing at the moment is a duplication in some of the work in prison, so we're finding delays with receiving information, um, some of the applications perhaps not being uh, fully completed, so it provides difficulties in us being able to source suitable accommodation in a timely manner. Um, the whole purpose of the prison link officer is so that we can we can have that early intervention so we can fully understand a person's needs before they're released so we're able to secure accommodation in, in readiness for that. Um, I mean, within Cardiff, in terms of our accommodation, we've, we've got a diverse range of accommodation options, um, but without that, that early planning, it's, it's impossible for us to be able to, to create that individual pathway plan. Um, I think in terms of some of the early release work that's going on at the moment, whilst com completely understood the reasons behind it, it adds an additional pressure. So, you know, as we heard in the first session, homeless services are under huge demand already and, and any increase on that really sort of sets us back even further so we're seeing the numbers coming through are incredibly high sort of early release for april alone was 16 on top of the 39 already due to be released so it makes it very difficult uh, for homeless services to be able to provide suitable accommodation for every one of those when we're getting information sometimes day before release when the Ministry of Justice considers this early re release schemes, do they liaise with you at the Council about to help anticipate the additional need that that will create? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, to be honest, because obviously the the first early release, I think, was October, wasn't it? So we were seeing very small numbers then. With this very recent change from sort of March, April, as I said, the numbers were incredibly high, sort of. 12 one month six and then 16 so yeah certainly from the information i know we weren't really um contacted to discuss sort of the impact that would have and are you able to give us a sense of um, kind of annual numbers of prisoners that cardiff council would have to help support yeah so in terms of i know obviously when we were looking at the 2019 data initially so 2019 20 we were looking at 288 prison leavers um, and then last financial year it was 328 um, so the increase there feels feels quite small, but when you think about it in the bigger picture of homelessness as well, like I said, any demand is is huge, and where we're seeing that early release data, that that's our real concern in terms of us being able to plan. Yeah. Um, and when we're considering accommodation for the prison release for this month or our general demand for the next five years, without us being able to have a clear picture of what that might look like, it obviously uh, makes it very difficult for us to be able to do so. When some of us visited Cardiff Prison recently, um, I, mean, I recall a prisoner telling us about being handed a, a tent. There was no accommodation to go to. How often does that happen in Cardiff? I mean, as a local authority, obviously, we've, we've never provided tents. It's not something that, that we would do. We are aware of other support services or the charities that have felt that that um, has been a sort of support option for for those leaving um, prison. So I, I don't have the data on it, but certainly we are aware that it did happen, and we did try to encourage charities or any any um, sectors that were providing that to encourage those individuals to to contact us in the day. It's that day contact. And some of the ones that we're aware of in Cardiff, I think, unfortunately, when they were looking at their um, release plan, if you will. A lot of them were, for whatever reason, stating that they had other accommodation options available to them. So as a homeless service, we weren't aware of those people likely to present. Um, so again, it comes back to kind of what that early conversation is like with that, with that prisoner so that we can effectively plan. But in terms of tents as an authority, um, we try to publicise quite heavily that that wasn't the option that we felt was safe and suitable and for people to encourage those to, to access the support services that we could offer. And, and kind of the inference from what you're saying is that city councils are actively discouraging giving of tents to prisoners. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
it's, it's, it's like I said, it's about that that conversation with us. If 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 those options, I suppose the concern as well is that it's not always visible. You know, yes, of course, there there are a, a small cohort within Cardiff City Centre, perhaps that would have would have pitched their tents. But it's the the greater concern as well is that those would choose to to move away from the city centre, very excluded, very unknown, um, and it obviously makes us difficult to, to be able to support from an outreach or multidisciplinary perspective then. Okay, thank you very much. Really, really helpful. Um, perhaps we could move now to, to, to Wrexham Council. If I could ask the same questions to Tracy Hagen and Liz Ridge, and perhaps one of you could just answer those questions, give us a sense of the kind of overall numbers of, of prisoners that uh, you as a county borough council are, are supporting each year and what you see as some of the principal challenges at this time. Please. Thank you. I, I would echo um, some of the comments made by my colleague in Cardiff. Um, in terms of numbers for Wrexham, in the last financial year, um, we had 120 requests for assistance and temporary accommodation. And of those, we had repeat presentations from 21 individuals. So they're not all new cases. Sometimes there are um, individuals who come through as a result of recall or reoffending, and so we didn't have 120 new individuals. We had 119 in effect. Um, 21, sorry, of those were were repeats. Um, we do have an issue in terms of stock within the county borough, in terms of secure accommodation and for use for temporary accommodation, and especially for um, single persons. Um, in terms of our waiting list. Um, over 42% of our waiting list is uh, demand for single person accommodation and that includes um, from, from from the waiting list, from our general waiting list, not just uh, from those who are leaving the secure estate. So we, we do have an issue with bricks and mortar, not so much with support services. We do have support services that we commission that can go in um, to support those who who are um, leaving prison to try and assist. But again, we cannot always guarantee that those who are released from prison turn up to present. So we may plan for someone to come to us and they don't turn up. So you can't always guarantee that when we do the assessments mm -hmm. um, through the prisoner pathway, that those individuals will turn up. Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes we will go through the pathway with an individual and we are notified that they don't need accommodation and that may fall down at the last minute and again they do present to us so we're then having to try and source suitable accommodation um, for individuals sometimes on the day of release and that can cause a, a difficulty for us especially when we're having to adhere to license conditions mm. there may be an exclusion area that we can't place um, an individual in a certain area of the city. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at that as well. And also the support networks. So there's a combination of a lot of um, difficulties, really, that we do encounter when someone uh, comes to, through the door. Okay, th thank you. That's really helpful. And that, that question that I asked to, uh, to Stephanie at uh, Cardiff Council about you know, prisoners being given tents to, to sleep in on the first night out, outside of the gate. Does that happen in, in Wrexham? Indeed not, no. 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 Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Tonya Antonazzi, please. Thank you, Chair. The um, question I wanted to know is, is that, are there any gaps in support for prison leavers in Wales as they move from the commu community accommodation services into settled accommodation? And if so, what are they? I'll, I'll go to Wrexham, seeing as you're on the screen. <laughs> Um, I, I think the main issue for us in terms of support services is um, the engagement of the individual. Sometimes um, the individual, when they move into more secure accommodation, um, feel that they no longer need that support. There is, I would suggest, um, quite a wait time for some in terms of mental health support. That can sometimes be um, a difficulty because the waiting times and the waiting list for um, mental health services um, is quite lengthy. And that can be a difficulty where we know that someone comes into temporary accommodation and they are supported. 
where we can, we move that support with that person into more secure accommodation and they can take that support with them. Now, we have some control over that where we commission support services through our housing support grant. But obviously, we have no control where someone is um, gaining more support, maybe through um, NHS services, for instance. We don't have any control over that. But where we can offer the support and where we commission the support services, we do support follows the individual into secure accommodation. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, much the same as, as Tracy has said. I mean, in, in Cardiff, I'm not sure if Wrexham do, we have the multidisciplinary team, which kind of have helped to, to bridge that gap slightly. So working more with those individuals with complex and multiple needs. So it, it's not obviously prison leaver specific, but certainly that cohort would be eligible to access that support. And in much the same way, it is trying to keep that support continuous when someone does, does move on into something that's more settled. Um, we also look at, uh, we've got a housing first scheme that is, that is solely for prison leavers within Cardiff, um, which has proven successful, but numbers are quite small in comparison. So we've, we've got 12 people on the scheme at the moment. So nine of those are accommodated and three are currently in custody that we're supporting to secure accommodation on release. Um, and with that, it's that early contact from that service whilst they're in custody, and then that support continues whilst they're in that accommodation. Um, but again, much the same as Tracy has said, whilst the MDT does help to bridge the gap in particular around mental health and substance misuse, um, I think that there probably is a fair way to go in terms of what those services look like and at what point they start to engage with, with those individuals. Yeah, and, and Stephanie, in your submission notes, the issue of prisoner leavers advising their resettlement teams that they've had, you know, they have arranged accommodation when, in fact, it's not actually the case. Um, what are the issues that might deter a homeless prisoner from identifying as homeless on release? What, what, what are the reasons behind it for you? Yeah, I'm, um, I suppose this is more anecdotally, I suppose, than any evidence, if, I, if I'm honest, Tonya. You know, some are, um, I suppose they've got concerns themselves about, about stating that they, they, they've got somewhere else to go. They don't want to access homeless services and then find themselves on that day having, having no other option. Um, I wouldn't know the specifics as to why they, they feel that would be the, the better plan. It's also about the timing of when those questions are asked and how often they are continued to be asked within, within that system. Like I've said at the start, you know, where there's some of the duplication of work and different services involved at different levels, it's really making sure that someone is having that really robust conversation around housing and what that means and what the implications are for someone's information being given. Um, and also that those checks are, are, are carried out, and I'm not suggesting that they're not. I, I don't know the process as to, as to how that works from, from inside prison, but where someone is suggesting that they've got an alternative option it is making sure that that is a viable option, and whether that's long-term or short-term, from a housing perspective, it gives us something to work towards in terms of the support we can offer. Somebody flagged with me about some local authorities not having CAS3 funding. Mm. Why wouldn't the local authority have that funding? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm honest. I, to, I assumed, it was my assumption, that all did. Obviously, we have it in Cardiff and it, and it mm. works well. Um, and I think where we differ to some other authorities is um, we don't have cast three specific accommodation. We work for the individual. We place based on their needs. The funding via CAS3 is obviously in place for that 84 days, but they remain in that accommodation and, and then we continue that support because... You know, it would obviously be detrimental to look to move after 84 days to ten, potentially move again, but n not aware of, of how or why other authorities wouldn't have that funding and utilise that. Would Lisa or Tracy know the answer to that? I'm sorry, I'm being nosy, I'm like a dog with a bone now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't them not on the scheme because we couldn't deliver. We don't have the stock to be able to commit um, properties for um, the scheme but it's duration, because we have so many coming through the door. Okay. Do you know how many other local authorities are in the same situation as yourselves? I'm, I'm not sure, to be fair. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Ruth Jones, please. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for attending today. It's, it's helpful to have the perspective of the local authorities here. And I'm, so, I'm interested because, obviously, both Wrexham and Cardiff, you have local prisons and you have to deal with people coming out of your local prisons. But I'm interested in maybe, is, is there a difference between, say, coming from a uh, prisoner's 
coming out from a different prison, say in England, um, and what about female prisoners as well? Because obviously they have to be housed in England, so they're coming back to Wales. How do you deal with these different groups, if you like, and you know, are they treated differently? Shall I start with Stephanie? Yeah. Um, so certainly not treated differently. I think what I've noted about the prison link officer, obviously we, we have a base within HMP Cardiff now, so what that's allowed that role to do is build the relationships with the staff and also with the, the prisoners themselves, with the individuals. So, so I think that would be something that we would need to look in terms of development for where we're seeing the numbers coming from prisons elsewhere as to how we, we form that same relationship with those services and with those individuals. So, um, as you mentioned, for females, all of ours, and we've looked at the data, you know, it's all Eastwood Park. The numbers are relatively low, um, and unfortunately where we're seeing some of those are, are um, kind of repeat ones, so where they've been, been recalled, sadly. Um, but I think it is more about us having the base within Cardiff, which has improved that relationship. But as I say, they're certainly not treated any differently. Um, we look at trying to form the same sort of accommodation pathway plan as we can do for, for each individual, regardless of, of the prison that they're coming from. Thank you. Can I ask Wrexham, please? <laughs> to Cardiff really um, we our female prisoners are in HMP style um, and we have obviously HMP all course in Liverpool that we take um, I've got prisoners um, same sort of thing really we try to engage very early with, with um, prisoners that are in England um, probation help us with that with the probation officer we've got close links with probation in Wrexham locally so we're able to sort of try and engage with that prisoner as soon as we're aware of what, when they're due for release um, it, it, it is difficult it is, it is um, not as easy as what it is with the pathway in, in Wales because we've got that you know clear clear pathway in Wales for prisoners in Wales but um, Wrexham do strive to 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 be able to help these prisoners in, in, in England when they're due for release in Wrexham. You've mentioned, Stephanie, that the, the link officer, in and, and that's going into your local prison, but you can't have a link officer with all the prisons, can you? So how does, how does, it, work, how does it actually in reality work that you know, people coming out, how much notice do you get, say, of a female coming from England to you? Um, it varies, and I think that's that's one of the issues of development for the prison pathway as a whole, regardless of whether the prison is Cardiff or within Wales or within England. There are times where it's it's very very last minute, and there are other cases where we get more of that early notification. As I say, sadly, some of the early notification is more of those those individuals that have already been within our services and have been recalled or, or an additional sentence for something different. So I think we've already got that involvement, but for for new new prisoners it, it the notice can be very short um and then as i say regardless of which prison they're coming from it, it leaves us very little time to work with that individual mm, all the services involved not just the individual and that rex and how how do you find that yeah, we do have an officer from um the pss who is the link officer um for female prisoners in style so um, that does help us in terms of notification. Having said that, the numbers are not great at all in terms of um, female prison release. And in the last um, financial year, we had a total of 18 and only 11 individuals. So the numbers are not as great as for the male uh, population. So we, we tend to manage, um, it seems to be easier and, and we find that female prison release are easier to place. That's interesting. So uh, are, are they coming back, I suppose, it's, they, they, are they coming back to home is, I suppose, the question, or are they, they, re, they are coming back? Okay. So, yes. So that means yes. support networks are hopefully in place already then. That's right, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I'll hand you back to the chair. Beth Winter, please. Oh, um, thank you. Um, just picking up on, on, on the previous section, um, Consistency, coordination, joined up approach, clarity, th those are the words kept being repeated about um, and, and how important they are, but unfortunately that doesn't necessarily work. So we're interested in finding out what your relationship is with the third sector organisations, housing associations, but I'm going to take it a little bit further also in terms of the relationship with probation and the prison, because 
if you're only getting notified the day somebody's it's about that holistic approach so it does does that work if not why um and what needs to change so do you want to go first Stephanie? yeah fine Thanks. yeah um i suppose linked with uh, probation and the prison itself um there's, there's a lot of services involved as we've all touched on as you mentioned this morning session as well there is a lot of duplication um so in terms of the the prisoner engagement, they're potentially meeting with three or four different services or agencies, including ourselves as a local authority. So I think certainly there needs to be a look at how we can streamline that process a little bit, um, making sure that individuals are getting that same information, again, that consistency that you've mentioned, mm. from that, that first day into custody, um, you know, where we've got sort of forward trust involved, probation. In terms of the referral process for homeless applications, as I note, that that needs to be tighter. There are obviously times where, um, where we look at the early release. You know, I appreciate that some of those um, time frames might be shorter. However, as, as a general pathway, in order for it to work, in order for us to give that individual the best opportunity of succeeding on release, it, it needs to be firmed up a little bit and some greater consistency. Where you talk about links with um, RSLs in terms of accommodation, move on accommodation, yeah. So we work well with our RSLs in Cardiff. Obviously, we manage a common housing waiting list. Um, so we've got a few different schemes that they've been involved in. Um, our, we've, we've got three managed accommodation sites, um, which are kind of pivotal to that housing-led approach to homelessness that we're taking in Cardiff. And there are three housing association blocks of accommodation where Cardiff Council will go in and provide that support. So to date, that's 159 units, I believe, with 100% tenancy sustainment. From temporary accommodation, which, you know, unfortunately is, is the greatest option for, in terms of numbers coming um, from prison, move on out of that into more settled using our common housing waiting list all housing associations agreed to our supported accommodation move on pathway um, so that was looking at providing a greater level of information to RSLs at that point of offer so a real holistic look at someone's needs and support at that time so they were best placed to provide the best support and the best match to accommodation as well so the sector organizations who, who do a huge amount of work in terms of support in relationships yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of what we've got, as I say, we, we've got the multidisciplinary team, which has got a lot of those third sector organisations within it as well. So we we're looking at um, some mental health services, substance misuse, police probation are all sort of signed up to that, that same model of support that we're working towards in that therapeutic approach. Um, and then outside of those as well, you know, we, we do have good links in Cardiff. I think there's always room for development. Is there because the needs of people change all the time? The numbers are continuing to increase. So there's, we're certainly not, not resting where we are, but um, I do feel that we've got good links with those. Okay. And, and Wrexham, your experience? Very similar, I would say. We have a nominations process in terms of our um, RSL partners. And that works very well for us. And, and also in terms of any supported accommodation, um, we will nominate through the gateway uh, and identify um, the more appropriate accommodation that's suitable. Um, and that works well. I think um, what we would be looking to is that we work with um, prisoners at an earlier stage yeah. and that probably it would be better if we could follow a similar mapper process for all prisoners yeah. because 66 days is not long enough for anyone to be in and to to assess the needs of anyone, um, the multi-agency for everyone to go in and to assess the needs of, of that person that's coming out of the secure estate. So we would, you know, and I know the white paper um, is looking at that as well in terms of Welsh Government's white paper that we go in um, earlier on. And, and arguably, when a, when a prisoner is, is first taken into custody, that we should be looking then at the need so that we can future plan yeah. when that individual is, is released. Yeah. Can I just... It's, it was my ignorance. Do you get notified of every prisoner's release, regardless of whether they need or present as homeless? Because so, I'm just concerned about people who fall, you know, there must be lots and lots of people who leave a prison who have fallen through the net. Well, I know there are, but yeah. So you don't get notified of every single... No. Okay. No. And for those that present, are you able always to provide some form of accommodation? 
or do they even for temporary accommodation have to go on a waiting list or are they asked you stay with the relative for a few days or because of the demand on, on your housing stock? Certainly in Cardiff we would have those conversations around any other safe and suitable alternative options. Um, again, I think this comes from that early intervention from housing at that that. F- that first day of entering to prison is is that realistic look at what accommodation is. Unfortunately, some are are coming out with greater expectations, and whilst we'd love to meet those expectations, unfortunately, that that's simply not the case at the moment. Um, so yeah, we do have conversations around any other options in the short term, so we can work towards a more a more suitable a more suitable accommodation offer. We do say that a lot of people, sorry, I'm not, who are leaving prison are offered a roof over their heads rather than a home which is what we talked about previously as well, because of the demand. This isn't a criticism of law. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, in terms of within <clears throat> Cardiff, you know, we've, we've rapidly increased our temporary accommodation. So we've got over 1,000 units of accommodation for single people, but we are still in a position where we're having to rely on some of that emergency-type provision in that shared space, which, you know, is, is far from ideal, um, but is essential <coughs> to meet that demand. So, yes, there are some that certainly would be offered... That setting where we've got the greater notice and the cast three type placements, and obviously they're offered more of our supported accommodation, self-contained style mm-hmm. model. Okay, thank you, sorry, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth Jones. Again. Um, <clears throat> so we we visited um, Cardiff Prison, and we were we were told there by some of the, the prisoners that they choose almost not to go into the hostel type accommodation because of the drink and the drugs um, and things like that. And they would prefer it to almost be on the streets because at least they can control their environment more. Um, bearing in mind it's sort of local authority uh, provision, how, what sort of support would you need to make things better here? Um, because these, these hostels, you know, obviously are, are providing a need, but, but if there's so much of an issue within them, what, what would you need to, to make them better, if you like? Um, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because in terms of the, the accommodation stock that, that we've got in Cardiff, I, I do appreciate, you know, we, we are dealing with the homeless cohort and some of those will obviously have substance misuse issues. Again, I think it's, it's breaking down some of those barriers for some individuals that perhaps uh, are coming into services for the first time, is that that stereotypical view doesn't exist across all accommodation or certainly doesn't look like they would expect it to look and that's not me suggesting that they're coming into a home as we've spoken about but certainly you know a lot of our accommodation has high levels of support there are there are a lot of kind of wraparound services around the accommodation that can support those individuals but do take on board in terms of some of those that are maybe coming out who have um reduce their their use themselves or have never been around that environment you know we're constantly looking in Cardiff as to what our accommodation can look like and what it needs to be whether we need larger projects smaller projects projects away from the city projects where someone is unable to drink or use substances Um, so we're constantly reviewing based on um, kind of feedback from individuals and the needs that we're seeing coming through. Mm, I suppose these the, these type of people are not the people who are going to give you feedback in your your questionnaires and things. They they will walk walk away rather than get back involved with drink and drug. And then certainly that was the experience we were told about. I'm just thinking in Wrexham, um, you know, we we were told that people don't even have a lock on their door. They you know on, onto their their bedroom door and things like that. They can't find secure accommodation. Is that a situation in Wrexham? And what would you do to make it better? Ideally, we need more stock and we need more single person accommodation. We, you know, we need the bricks and mortar so that we are providing a home rather than, um, as, you, as you put it, a, a roof over someone's head. Uh, the reality of it is that we don't have that stock. Mm-hmm. And so we are trying as best we can to provide the safest and most suitable accommodation that we have available at the mm-hmm. time. So we know that the the stock that we have in terms of if there's multiple um, rooms in an accommodation that they do have locks on the doors so that they have got they can secure themselves in in their accommodation and we do provide support even if we have the use of um, hotel accommodation for instance we do provide support officers down on a daily basis to feedback any issues that. Um, individuals may have obviously everyone has the right to appeal so if we if we get it wrong and we put someone in a placement that isn't suitable for them 
we can then look for an alternative and move them on. Mm-hmm. So we do have processes in place. That doesn't stop um, someone feeling they can't approach us upon release. I, I don't know how we how we get around that mm-hmm. to, to convince someone that, you know, we are there to try and help and support them as best we can. Um, but basically, we do need additional resources. Oh, absolutely. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose, um, obviously, you deal with uh, private rented accommodation as well, maybe. Um, how, how do you deal with the landlords there who are providing substandard uh, accommodation? Because obviously, these, these ex-offenders are, are likely to end up there as well. How do you deal with these? In terms of temporary accommodation, we, we don't use substandard accommodation at all. We, we wouldn't engage a landlord who wasn't registered with Rent Smart Wales or who we hadn't visited the accommodation that we were using in the first instance to ensure that that, that accommodation was um, to, a, to a, a standard that we felt um, you know, met the benchmark. And we have turned landlords away in the past where we visited accommodation and, and it wasn't up to standard, so we haven't um, taken them on. We do have a local lettings agency in Wrexham, um, which is run by the local authority, whereby we do work with landlords in the private sector and we manage their properties for them. And therefore, we do go in and uh, manage the properties and the tenancies, but we initially go in and make sure that the property is up to standard before we engage with that landlord. I suppose, Stephanie, if, if, you, if you're dealing with a landlord who has... Subs- the accommodation is not up to scratch, um, and it may have been lovely at the beginning, but how, you know, how do you deal with them later on? What sort of regulations and standards can you hold them to account with? In terms of after we've placed somebody in there, you mean, and yeah, they've left yes, the standards? So, yeah, um, so with, within ourselves, much the same as, as Wrexham. So we've got a sort of dedicated private rented sector team, and we also um, have properties under the Welsh Government leasing scheme as well. So within that, we've got um, a property conditions assessor. So you know, within that relationship for that PRS team, it's the link between us and the landlord, the landlord and the client, and us and the client. Um, so it's it's checks of the properties. Um, we work closely with our shared regulatory services. So if there are concerns around that accommodation that haven't been addressed despite that request from the landlord, um, that's when we work with our partners as shared regulatory services to also um, get involved and inspect the property. You know, we want to support the landlord and not take it down to the levels where perhaps there needs to be action taken against them. But certainly if, if, if that's the route it's going, then that's, that's where where we'll have to take it. In terms of the individual that's placed in there, of course, if the property becomes unsuitable for any reason, then we would look for an alternative option for them. And you're confident you have enough powers to be able to do that now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you very much. Can I just ask um, a question to to, to both sets of witnesses? Uh, Have you seen a reduction in the overall number of properties available for private rental? in your, your local authority areas in recent years? Wrexham, you're nodding, so perhaps you could uh, answer first. I think um, it's what I refer to as the Rob and Ryan effect. Because what effect, oh, sorry? The Rob and Ryan effect. Okay. I refer to it as because... <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Wrexham football, yeah, yeah. Football club have been that um, successful that we find a lot of our private landlords are now moving away from offering properties into the private rented sector and are turning them into Airbnb yeah. because they can get more money. So and we, therefore, we've seen a, a, a huge decrease in the number of um, private sector accommodation that we can utilise. Mm-hmm. We, we've seen the same thing in Pembrokeshire without the, 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 the Robin Ryan effect. <laughs> because, and I suspect, I'm going to ask um, Stephanie from Cardiff, you're, have you seen the same thing? Yeah, definitely, and the same. Not not celebrity influence, I don't think. But yeah, you know, in terms of Airbnbs, we've obviously got a huge student population in Cardiff as well. And I think renting homes, you know, for some landlords, we, we sponsor the Cardiff Landlord Forum, so we get to to speak to landlords, um, you know, on a quarterly basis there. Um, I think it was for some perhaps the, the final straw, perhaps a little bit older, accidental landlords, if you will, and, and it was just the, the thing to push them out of the market. And then the accommodation that we have got, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get anything that's affordable. Um, the increase in local housing allowance on paper um, looks like that will improve that. You know, where we saw at the start of the years in, in 
as in the calendar year, our um, difference between our average rent in Cardiff and the LHA was about £170, which obviously is, is not affordable for, for anyone in receipt of benefits. We're now seeing that that's um, a shortfall of £50, which makes it more affordable. But to caveat that, we've seen a lot of our landlords increase their rents um, based on the, the increase in LHA. So it's just something that we need to continue to monitor and see what impact it has. Essentially um, across Wales, as the scale of need has increased, whether that's specifically relating to prisoners or actually whether it's across the board yep. housing generally, the scale of the need has gone up and the availability of Scott stock has gone significantly down absolutely. in the last five years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think where we refer to the private sector about prisoners specifically as i've said our housing first model only works with private landlords you know obviously that's very different there is a, a huge amount of support that goes into it and there is a financial element but part of our role within that private rented sector team is to try to break down some of those barriers so for the landlords that we have got left for prisoners and homeless population in general is is to break that stigma you know for a lot of individuals that are coming through they don't need high levels of support they are able to manage independently independently and have just found themselves at this difficult point so it's it's a continuous conversation for us to try to to bring some of those real life homeless kind of case studies if you will so landlords have got a better understanding of of who these individuals are and for a lot of them it's the people that they've sadly had to give notice to because they've chosen to reduce their portfolio or or change their portfolio in some way and, and let me just ask i'll bring in ben lake in a moment and, and using some of, the, some of the language perhaps around you know some of the mythology if you like around prisoners and housing do prisoners when they get released go to the front or the back of the queue um, I suppose every, everyone is assessed really based on, on, their, on their needs, you know, for us. So certainly we, we've got a particular pathway for it. Our aim would be under that prison pathway to make sure that every individual that comes through that route is offered safe and suitable accommodation. Um, you know, as I've said, we are competing against a huge demand. Um, so we do have to look at individual needs. And sometimes we are in a position where we're having to make quite difficult decisions um, around accommodation. So... A, a queue perhaps isn't the best way to term it. It is certainly just having a look at, at the at the needs of, of every individual that requires our assistance. Mm. Okay, thank you. But, and then just to, to Lisa and Tracy at Wrexham as well, a so, so similar question. I mean, um, I know Stephanie says it isn't a queue as such, but there is a very, very long list, list of people hoping and wanting to get housing support through the local authority. And do, do prisoners, when they're released from... Uh, Berwyn or when prisoners get come back to the Wrexham, the Wrexham home area, um, how do you go about prioritising their, their needs above other residents who haven't been through the criminal justice system? Um, and in terms of temporary accommodation, um, they, they do get priority on release for prison uh, if they have get no other, Yeah, they do get priority. Um, on release for prison if they need temporary accommodation and that accommodation is sourced as quickly as possible through the pathway for them, whatever that looks like on the day of release. Um, as mentioned earlier by Cardiff, we, we do explore options where it's appropriate to do so, where they can go and stay with friends or family for a period of time and then come to us for temporary accommodation if, if that comes to an end. Um, but for general move on accommodation under our, our allocation waiting list, they will, they will sit in the same band as every other homeless um, presentation, um, as in families, couples, older person, um, and they'll just join the waiting list for move on accommodation like everybody else in that band, um, but can stay in their temporary accommodation for as long as, as, as they need to be ready for move on. Move on is slow for single person accommodation, though, that, that it's, and I think that's across Wales um, in every area. We don't have the, the stock to meet the demand that we've got coming through the door for housing options assistance. Mm -hmm. okay. So move on for a single person accommodation can be 18 months, two years, three years, depending depending where we get the vacancies within the borough. Difficult. Thank you very much. Ben Lake, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Stephanie, if I can ask you first, obviously, um, coming from a, a local authority which has a prison within its uh, sort of jurisdiction, I mean, just to understand a bit more about what happens, say, if um, uh, an individual is released from prison that, you know, technically speaking, are registered or have a fixed address elsewhere in Wales or, or the UK for that matter, but present themselves to you very last minute um, 
in need of, of accommodation. How does that, or how would the, um, in this case, Cardiff City Council, uh, go about trying to accommodate that need? So in the first instance, obviously, we'd like to avoid that, and that's where it comes into our involvement as early as possible so we can assess that person's eligibility for homeless assistance in Cardiff, so checking that local connection. Where someone does turn up kind of homeless on the day, if you will, you know, often we're, we're seeing prisoners being released that, that do have more high or complex needs. So, you know, there are times where, depending on their circumstances, we can accommodate whilst we do the referral to their, their local connection, their area of local connection. As I say, the ideal would be that that person is um, kind of there's a plan for them in, in their area of local connection. Um, but outside of that, there are occasions where we're able to provide accommodation pending the, the return to their area of local connection. Okay. And does it happen often you know, when somebody might? And no, not on release from prison, it doesn't. No, I mean, Cardiff's quite a popular city for some to present as homeless too. But, um, you know, we're, we're, seeing, we're not seeing huge numbers of, of prison release coming from it. Where we do see it perhaps is those that maybe have shared that they've got elsewhere to stay on release from prison and that breaks down and then they look to present there. But certainly on, on day of release, we, we don't see a huge number presenting that don't have the local connection to Cardiff. And in those um, circumstances where somebody perhaps had or previously had a, somewhere to stay elsewhere but then that falls through mm -hmm. presents themselves to yourself is it a case that you then liaise with their home local authority um to, to secure something more long term for them yeah it would be generally speaking yeah. yes i suppose the only thing to consider with that is is where a lot of the uh, single person homeless cohort yeah you know, can be quite transient, can't they? It's very difficult sometimes to be able to establish where their area of local connection is. And um, we do have a waiver process within Cardiff where we can consider individual needs and those sort of circumstances where they've moved around a fair amount and perhaps don't really have any solid roots or support in a particular area. Thank you. And, and if I can turn to um, Wrexham as, as well and ask just a similar question. Is, is it something that happens often for yourselves? And, and um, uh, when it does occur, is it a similar procedure that you have in terms of liaising with their um, home local authority, for want a better way of putting it. Yeah, that's very, very similar to Cardiff. We, we don't have high number of um, prison release or, or anybody coming to Wrexham who don't have that local connection. Um, where that does happen, and it does happen on occasion, um, we will try to liaise with their local connection area. Mm. Um, we would, in most cases, I would suggest, um, accommodate on a reasonable step if they need accommodation before we can reconnect them um, under under our powers and then give them travel warrants etc to, to go to their connection area to, to present to their to that local authority um, but not huge numbers at all oh, great and and just on, on that front you know do you feel as though there's um, a good way and good contact between local authorities, not just in Wales, but also within the UK on these matters. You know, do you feel you have a good contact with, say, Ceredigion? <laughs> so if somebody did present themselves for you, uh, having been released from Berwyn, you could get in touch with them in Ceredigion? Yes, because generally, if, if somebody presents to Wrexham who has a local connection elsewhere and we contact that local authority, yeah. nine times out of ten, they're, they're familiar with the case. Great. Anyway, for example... Um, about two or three years ago, we had a lady present from Scotland, um, didn't want to be in Scotland anymore. And when we contacted the, the local authority in Scotland, they were fully aware of her. And, you know, we, we reconnected her back to that area as soon as possible, but accommodated as an interim yeah. in Wrexham until we could source out um, travel back, back to that local area. So, you know, it does work well between local authorities, I would say. Fantastic. Thank you. My, my final question then, and... Um... Clearly, you know, from recent inspections, we, we know that there are still um, a significant number of, of prisoners who are released into homelessness uh, on the day of the release. Um, and so from your experiences and your expertise, um, is there anything that you'd like to see either UK government or Welsh government do, whether that's change of policy, um, new resource that would help uh, reduce the number of, of uh, individuals who are released into homelessness in the future? Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because we, we in, in some circumstances, that some of the prisoners that come out of prison have accommodation, but they're not allowed to return to it because of licence conditions. Right. So that makes it very difficult for us. Um, 
to try and move them on. If, if somebody's an owner occupant, for, for example, we do have now. Yeah, we have got a case now where where a, a, a prison prisoner coming out of prison is an owner occupier in in the borough, and license conditions are preventing him to return to his home. Right. So the the responsibility falls on the local authority under the under the uh, homeless legislation to to accommodate the you know this person and and help them try and move on to alternative accommodation where his license conditions are not broken. Yeah, mm. well, thank you. That's that's very helpful. And and Stephanie, same question to you. Really, if you know if <coughs> if you were able to draw up a wish list of of any changes to policy or certain resources that would help um, reduce the number of individuals released into homelessness would you have any thoughts on that yeah i think you know katie touched on it at this morning session around some of those shorter sentences um they can feel quite difficult to manage um i suppose i'm not saying that would prevent <coughs> um, release into homeless services but it certainly seems to set us back in terms of the progress that we might have made with that individual of course stock will always be something that we would be looking for and to do that there needs to be funding in order to do so you know some of our schemes as i've touched on have got really positive and really high success rates um, but the feasibility of being able to expand those to try to ensure that people are moving whether it's housing first model or managed accommodation model w- without that stock availability and that funding behind it is unfortunately not something that we're able to do at this time Thank you, and, and thank you to all three of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Have, have either of your local authorities invested in these um, almost like pod-like emergency accommodation units? Stephanie and Cardiff, is that something... Like the modular bill type things? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, to I mean, the ones I've seen, and I've seen kind of charities in West Wales have, have got some which they use as kind of emergency, kind of overnight accommodation. I'm not sure whether that includes ex- uh, prison leavers, uh, mm-hmm. But certainly, people who found themselves being literally turfed out on the street for whatever reason, and they're kind of almost like these tubular-like, uh, yeah, very very small pods. But so, no, not that particular model. In Cardiff, we we are utilising kind of modular builds mm-hmm. more so now. Um, some of that has been family provision, but within our um, uh, plans, sorry, going forward, then then that's something that we plan on doing more so of. It's relatively quick i'm not saying it's quick at all but it's quicker than, than building new provision so yeah more than the modern tent, right? builds. well absolutely yep. yeah. yeah yeah and uh lisa in in wrexham is that something those kind of structures is, a, a, is that a potential part of a complex solution we have looked into it in the past uh, but we don't have the land or the space to, to be able to, to have the land or the space to be able to accommodate the modular homes or pods. Um, so that's a barrier for us in Wrexham. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and thank you to all three of you and to our first panel as well. It was a really, really helpful session looking at obviously a very big and complicated challenge uh, as part of our inquiry into prisons in Wales. So thank you very much. Thanks to colleagues, and we'll bring this session to a close. Order. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.